We will restore science to its rightful place and wield technology's wonders. We live in an age of science, technology, progress. Modern science has remade our world, but at what cost? During the first half of the 20th century, three prophetic writers warned about the dark side of scientific and technological progress. G.K. Chesterton, George Orwell, and C.S. Lewis. Best known for his Narnia stories and his books of Christian theology, C.S. Lewis also had an intense interest in the growing power of scientism, the effort to use the methods of science to explain and control every part of human life. Lewis was very much a skeptic and a critic of scientism. He was opposed to an ideology which, in his view, had been confused with science. It was a particular materialistic approach which wanted to reduce everything that we could learn scientifically uh, to materialistic causes, blind, undirected, causes. Uh, Lewis thought that science was what was a perfectly legitimate enterprise. He never denied it. He, he uh, in fact, studied it quite a bit. He never, so far as I know, attacked science itself. What he attacked was scientism. This idea that the method or the methods really of natural science should be the bar by which every other intellectual discipline must be held. Just like in all human disciplines, Lewis thought that science could be corrupted and that some people could pursue science because they wanted power over the world and power over other people in particular. And I think what he saw was that you had to avoid those extremes in the, in the um, not only in the employment of science but in the popularization of it. You could not afford to ignore the finding of science, the importance of scientific method. You had to see that it's one of the greatest um, applications and developments of the rational method per se, a subset of the rational method, but that it was very dangerous and that in the 20th century it had had very malignant consequences to deify it. Scientific socialism, credible, credibly a scientific version of politics, the Marxists called their system scientific socialism. Well, no one in his right mind in 2012 will say that, that Marxism was scientific no one in his right mind, but people did for 150 years, 170 years. Social Darwinist racial science in Nazi Germany. Enormous prestige was given to racialist views by their apparent clothing. Uh, people such as, 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 uh, as Heckel and Molschott and Büchner popularizing reductive scientific ideas with immense success. In many ways, more success in, in Germany than in, than in England. Lewis saw these developments. He saw that, that two world wars, in which one he served and was badly wounded, had roots in barbaric and hysterical 
scientistic ideas, abuses of the scientific method, abuses of scientific terminology and language, abuses of scientific faith. When warning about the abuse of science, Lewis made an unusual comparison. Although most people think of science as something modern, Lewis compared it to something ancient, magic. C.S. Lewis thought that science and magic are twins. Now, if you think about this, this might seem very strange. But, you know, I think that Lewis was very perceptive here. Uh, in fact, he highlighted three different ways that science and magic really are quite similar. The first way science and magic are similar, according to Lewis, is their ability to function as a religion. Uh, certainly, a magical view of the world can give one a sense that there's something more than just our everyday lives. If you walk through a forest and think it's enchanted, it gives you a sense of a, a grand vision that there's something out there uh, that we don't ordinarily experience. It can give you a sense of meaning. I think there's a real reason why fantasy stories are so beloved, whether it be Lewis's own Chronicles of Narnia or J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter. It really strikes a deep chord in people, whether they're religious or not, about a sense of grandeur in the universe, something higher than ourselves. And in fact, for some people who aren't religious, this magical view of the world can actually be even more attractive because it substitutes for that. Well, in the same way, science can be an alternate religion. And during Lewis's own time, there were people like H.G. Wells who turned, say, Darwin's theory of evolution into this cosmic theory of life developing in this blind struggle in the universe, and then human life develops, sort of this heroic character fighting against nature, and then eventually man evolved and evolves himself through eugenics into a race of demigods. But for man, no rest and no ending. He must go on, conquest beyond conquest. First this little planet and its winds and waves, and then all the laws of mind and matter that restrain it. Then the planets about it, and at last, out across immensity to the stars. And when he has conquered all the deeps of space and all the mysteries of time, still he will be beginning. And this sort of epic struggle, this cosmic struggle of evolution was really an alternate religion for H.G. Wells. And you know, you see that same thing today. Whether it be Oxford biologist Richard Dawkins who says that Darwin helps us become an intellectually fulfilled atheist, or uh, in 2012 we had 10 to 20,000 people converge on Washington DC in the United States. Uh, for this reason rally where a lot of the people testifying were they really offer science as a religion. If you look at the Royal Society of London, the equivalent for the British Commonwealth, again about 90% of them are atheists. And so today I think you see a lot of people speaking in the name of science who offer science as a quasi-religion. It's what gives their uh, lives meaning. Another area that we see this today is in the whole celebration of Darwin's birthday. Hundreds of colleges, community organizations, if not thousands around the world, on February 12th every year hold Darwin Day celebrations. Sometimes they have birthday cakes, they have special concerts even, they, with hymns towards Darwin. I mean, it's, it really takes on the trappings of a religion.
with the knowledge of the first atomic explosions to guide us, our chances for survival will be far better than those of the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, if we act on our knowledge and are prepared. A second way science and magic are similar, according to Lewis, is their encouragement of a lack of skepticism. Now again, this may seem just completely outlandish, because science, how does that promote gullibility? Science is supposed to be just the hard facts. Now, of course, magic, you can think of in you know, the tribes, has a witch doctor and they believe whatever the witch doctor says. And so being you know, magical thinking can promote a type of credulous thinking where you just trust what the authority figure says. But how does science promote that type of credulous or gullible thinking? Lewis pointed out that in the modern world, people will believe almost anything if it's dressed up in the name of science. He's going to be all right. Of course he's going to be all right. Ah, uh, sure, Mom. The doc here just wants to cut a little of the badness out of me. <laughs> For Lewis, one of the leading examples of science-fueled gullibility was Freudianism. Lewis had an interest in Sigmund Freud since his days as an Oxford undergraduate. Lewis was intrigued by some of the claims of psychoanalysis, but he ultimately rejected the effort by Freud's followers to explain everything from religion to stealing cars as a result of our subconscious urges. Before the police finally caught up with him, Peter took about 30 cars. A car had meaning to him. In a symbolic way, it represented his mother. Since he could not get her, he had to have a substitute. And a car was that substitute. Hence his thrill every time he drove a car. Hence his continuous stealing. To the average reader, such an explanation may seem far-fetched. Yet clinical experience shows that a car often stands for a woman. In daily language, we often call a car she. When we have the tank filled with gasoline, we say, fill her up. Well, Lewis pointed out that if you actually take Freud's view to its eventual conclusion, that actually undermines even the belief in Freudianism. Suppose, suppose you, you had a, a Freud, uh, somebody kind of like Freud, and this person who is kind of like Freud said, no one ever believes anything for a reason because there's always some other uh, explanation for why they, why they believe it, other than their reason for believing it. Well, that would be true of religious people, but it would also be true of Freud, right? Freud himself. Lewis's point is where does this end? If you really think that all reasoning fundamentally is based on sub-rational urges and that we can't analyze those urges and there isn't real reason that we can judge uh, on, based on evidence, and that we can't be self-critical, then that destroys Freudianism just like it destroys everything else. Shortly after Lewis accepted Christianity, he satirized Freud in his allegory, The Pilgrim's Regress. In Lewis's story, the main character John ends up being thrown in jail by a character named Sigismund Enlightenment. Sigismund was actually Sigmund Freud's real first name. He ended up shortening it later. And so this was very much a parody of Freud. And, but what is this jail that he's thrown into? Well, it's a jail governed by this giant. And this giant has a particular propensity that anything that he looks at becomes transparent. And so when this pilgrim character is thrown into this dungeon, into this jail, it's a jail of horrors because whenever he looks at someone, he doesn't see them. He sees their insides, their intestines. He sees through them. And it's horrible. It's like, it's, it's like a, a, you know, a house of horrors. And that was Lewis's pictures, really, of where Freudianism leads you. It, if you try to deconstruct everything, you're left with nothing. Another example of science-inspired gullibility, according to Lewis, was what he called evolutionism, the popular idea that matter could magically transform itself into complex and conscious living things through a blind and unguided process. Lewis's doubts about unguided evolution went back to his days as a soldier in World War I, 
While recovering from shrapnel wounds, a young Lewis read the book Creative Evolution by French natural philosopher Henri Bergson. Bergson questioned the ability of Darwin's theory to account for complex structures like the human eye through a blind process like natural selection. Lewis believed that evolutionism, like Freudianism, contained a fatal self-contradiction regarding the human mind. According to the Darwinian view, reason was simply the unforeseen and unintended byproduct of a mindless process based on survival of the fittest. Lewis pointed out the key difficulty with the Darwinian account of reason. If my own mind is a product of the irrational, he asked, how shall I trust my mind when it tells me about evolution? In his personal copy of Charles Darwin's autobiography, Lewis underlined passages where Darwin had asked himself the same question. But then with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of a man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? What this means is that if natural selection and random genetic mutations gave rise to our intellectual capacities, we should assume that our intellectual capacities are consistent with survival enhancing behavior, but we should have no especially good reason to believe that we actually know truth or that you know, we, our intellectual faculties even have that capacity of connecting with truth as one of its natural outcomes, because that's not always designed for. If anything, our reason is just sort of along for the ride with our survival enhancing behaviors, which natural selection over millions of years has selected. So the implication of Lewis's argument here is that if naturalism is true and the Darwinian mechanism more or less accounts for our faculties, we probably shouldn't trust our reason. The idea that a blind and purposeless process without a mind can produce things like human beings that have minds and produce moral beliefs and things that sometimes go against our need for physical survival. The idea that a mindless process of survival in the fittest could create such things really was an outlandish one, according to Lewis. Uh, how could a mindless process produce minds? And uh, to think that it could really what just shows how gullible people can be in the name of science. Three, two, one, zero. The third similarity between science and magic, according to Lewis, is the quest for power. Magic was about the quest for power. Magicians wanted to have power over the world and over the universe. They wanted to harness the powers of nature and the, the deeper powers of nature in order to control it. And Lewis said that much of modern science uh, not all, but much of modern science was actually devoted towards power over the world. For many people in the 20th century, the power of modern science was its greatest virtue. They hoped science would usher in a new age of peace and prosperity, a scientific utopia. All curves and plastic, Monsanto's House of the Future is open to the public at Disneyland. The four-wing plastic shell makes a snug and solid five-room dwelling designed for a family of four. And coincidentally, it's a fairly typical family of four that gets first look. A family food center to store atomically irradiated food. A work surface that includes a combination supersonic dishwasher and storage unit. A look at the future. Looks good, eh? For the scientific utopians of Lewis's era, science was the savior that would allow us to remake our world. What gets under your skin about research is the attitude of the men in the labs. They work on the principle that nothing is impossible. You hear that, Bud? Oh, well, sure, but I don't believe it. Open your eyes, Bud. The proof's all around you. And of course, that can be good. Modern science brings us good things. Uh, many things from the microwave oven to the computers to uh, 
life-saving treatments of modern medicine, which Lewis certainly appreciated. But on the other hand, that tendency to want to control things can bring us the Orwellian state of you know, George Orwell's 1984. And so Lewis thought that modern science, in fact, was far more dangerous than magic because magic failed. You know, magic doesn't work <laughs> at the end of the day. And so it wasn't so dangerous because people actually couldn't use it to control the world. Modern science has the potential that you really can control uh, people. If you find the right drugs or find the right treatments, you can manipulate them. And so if you don't have some other way of protecting and limiting what you do in the name of science, some ethical basis that isn't dictated by science itself that can control it, then you are facing a really bleak uh, future. Lewis's critique of scientific utopianism was at the heart of his novel That Hideous Strength, which tells the story of a conspiracy to transform England into a scientific dictatorship. The conspiracy is led by a government bureaucracy with the deceptively innocuous name of the National Institute of Coordinated Experiments, or NICE. I think that that hideous strength and Huxley's Brave New World are the two greatest dystopias in our language in the 20th century. The agenda of NICE in that hideous strength reads like a wish list drawn up by the era's leading scientific social reformers it included sterilization of the unfit, selective breeding, biochemical conditioning, experimentation on both animals and criminals, and above all, truly scientific planning. A scientific planning that is pretending to, uh, to uh, provide a new humanity that is doing away with traditional ethics, that is doing away with all traditional restraints. Lewis depicts a world in that hideous strength in which nothing is sacred. Um, Daniel Bell has told us that the essence of modernity is that nothing is sacred. In, in the abolition of man and also in that hideous strength, we see the consequences of a world in which nothing is sacred, which includes the human person. The human person is not sacred, and when that happens, there are no distinctions between individuals or humans and animals or humans and vegetables or humans and minerals, and we have the kind of thing we've had in the 20th century. In the two decades before his death, Lewis became increasingly alarmed by the rise of scientific authoritarianism. Lewis was very concerned by the dogmatic use of science. And that is why he wrote his novel, That Hideous Strength. That is why he wrote his book, The Abolition of Man, where he actually worries and, and somewhat sort of predicts the rise of a new class of people, of experts speaking in the name of science, who would dictate to everyone else. In fact, by the end of his life, Lewis was worrying about the rise of what he called scientocracy. Uh, government and society that claims to be based on the claims of modern science, but in reality really is based on a scientific clique of a few people who are speaking in the name of science. And maybe they are adopting the majority view of science, but they're claiming the right to rule based on their scientific knowledge and expertise. Lewis's concern about authoritarian science seems eerily prophetic. In a world driven by science and technology, those who question the new order, like C.S. Lewis did, increasingly find themselves labelled anti-science. C.S. Lewis would have rejected the charge. Lewis did not accept uh, the idea that, that science was a special form of knowledge that was somehow immune to inspection. 
that was some, somehow uh, cordoned off from the non-specialist uh, assessing uh, the deliverances of the sciences. Lewis was well aware that, uh, first of all, that there's no such thing as science as such. There are sciences, and each science has its particular methods uh, and its uh, particular areas of study. Uh, and also that, that uh, the science says to be good need to interact with one another, but they do so uh, by, by means of the larger tools of good, uh, rational, critical thinking. Uh, and so that the, the, um, the things that the scientists say are subject to review by, by everyone who is able to think well, to think critically, to think rationally. Lewis did not deny that scientific expertise might be necessary for good public policy in many areas, but he insisted that science alone was not sufficient. Knowing, say, how things work, knowing how cells work, uh, or knowing uh, how ecosystems work, doesn't tell you what you ought to do for your society. Because public policy is not just about the technical expertise of how things work, it's about what good is worth having at what price? And as C.S. Lewis pointed out, on these questions, a scientific training gives you no added value. Scientists are not moral philosophers, yet political and social judgments involve not just how do things work and how can we make them work better, but uh, how should we act? And what's worth spending money on? And what's worth doing? And um, what freedoms are worth giving up? or not. And on these sorts of moral and ethical questions, someone's science training doesn't give them the right to dictate to the rest of society. C.S. Lewis thought that science was a good thing, but he also thought that it held some really strong dangers. The biggest danger really was the penchant to control. Uh, in a scientific view, if you think that is the only way that we have knowledge of the world, and so uh, if you think that if I have the scientific truth about something, that's you know, the end of story, I know everything, that really tends to feed a power trip. Whether you're a scientist or you're a politician who's trying to latch on to the prestige of science, uh, you really have people who are going to abuse their power because they think, look, we're the only ones who know what should happen because we know how the universe really works. Therefore, we should be able to dictate uh, what our cultural beliefs are. We should dictate what uh, our government should do, how we should design governmental programs. We should dictate uh, all manner of public policy and that anyone who doesn't have a scientific training or isn't part of the consensus view of science is basically stupid or against progress or against science and so should be really swept by the wayside and shouldn't be listened to. And I think Lewis thought that that almost totalitarian impulse was really a dangerous thing. Lewis I think was properly so, frightened by that uh, potential within science. And that's why he stressed why we really need a way to understand the limits of science. And that uh, there is something behind science, a larger transcendent ethical sphere behind science, uh, and that we aren't just blind matter in motion, that we're part of a designed universe that actually sets limits on what we should and shouldn't do. It's an age-old problem. How do we prevent something good from being twisted for evil ends? C.S. Lewis hoped that scientists themselves would find a way to rescue science from scientism, creating a regenerate science that respected human rights and honored human dignity, a science that would no longer be the magician's twin. Thank you.
Thank you.